Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yawa Shah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Saibas. Wow! After two years of bringing the community together online, we are absolutely delighted to be here back in person and to continue extending Saibas to delegates from all around the world, first time virtually in a hybrid experience. And to all of you digitally that are out there, let me welcome you as well. A lot has changed since the last time I was on this stage. The world has undergone unprecedented transformation, shaped by the global pandemic, geopolitical shifts, recalibration of supply chains, accelerating digitization, and significant economic turbulence. But in spite of all this, our industry has proven itself to be highly adaptable, demonstrating great resilience under extraordinary pressure, and with an ability to innovate during these difficult times. We have an important role to play now more than ever before. And that frames our themes for the week. We have a lot of great sessions to look forward to. And this starts now with our first speaker. It is my absolute privilege to introduce our opening speaker, Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. In her capacity as the United Nations Secretary General Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development, Queen Maxima is a leading voice for financial inclusion around the world, championing responsible innovation that supports universal access to safe and effective financial services. For more than a decade, she has served as the UN Special Advocate, advancing important ESG issues to the top of the country and corporate agendas in support of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. She is active in many other forms as well, including the G20's Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion. The World Economic Forum's Global Challenge Initiatives on the future of the global financial system. And here at home, the Dutch Committee for Entrepreneurship and the Dutch MoneyWise platform. And Queen Maxima is certainly familiar with that industry, having worked and trained as an economist and banker. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome to the Saiba stage, Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure it is to be with you to open this Saiba 2022. Our theme, Progressive Finance for a Changing World, could not be more timely. The rise of inclusive finance is a genuine good news story at a moment of great challenges. Over the last decade, a quarter of the world's adult population has gained access to financial services. Fully 76% of adults are now in some way included. This is a remarkable achievement, which has unlocked new opportunities for millions of people previously left behind. Investments in critical digital public infrastructure, such as greater connectivity and digital IDs, have laid the foundation for this amazing growth. And the rise of digital payments has driven a massive increase in account ownership. In the last four years, Almost 40% of adults in developing economies open their first account to receive a wage or a government payment. Millions of small merchants are now paid or making payments with their own phones in their own pockets, transforming their ability to manage their finances and invest in their businesses. This, in turn, has enabled financial service providers, especially new fintech players to innovate in the design and delivery of new products and services. The rapid growth in mobile phone use and new customer data trails offer exciting new ways to deliver financial products by leveraging big data and AI, especially in emerging markets. Yet, 
We should not seek innovation for innovation's sake. With each new technology, such as central bank digital currencies, for example, we must always ask, what problems are we trying to solve? And what future are we envisioning to stand the best chance at achieving long-term success? How do we provide more value beyond what existing platforms can already deliver? Well, the first priority is to make sure we do no harm. Ensuring key digital public goods are in place, like cybersecurity, consumer protection, data governance, and digital literacy can help marginalized communities navigate financial services more safely and in ways that really work for them. Fair competition and interoperable payment systems can help markets work better for even the smaller scale customers. But that is only a first step. We have a chance today to move beyond doing no harm to actually doing good. So beyond transaction volume and customer acquisition, can we create the rails for transformative change to help users become, become more financially healthy? Just as we should not innovate for innovation's sake, we should not design products simply to maximize short-term results. Rather, it is important to see how much value we can generate in the long run. Value for customers that in turn translates into value for firms. For example, one Australian bank invested in measuring financial well being of their customers to understand their behaviors and to develop products that could help them become more financially healthy. This resulted in a gold tracker program that helped 20% of their non savers to start saving regularly. How can we do more of this? How can we help people to better manage their day-to-day -day finances, to get access to credit, to plan and meet future goals, and at a time of multiple crises, to build resilience and ensure themselves against shocks? To do so makes real good business sense. Financially healthy customers are better customers, and those who provide these services can differentiate themselves from other providers. But for the moment, that is not what is happening. Today, despite growth in account ownership, only 55% of adults in developing economies can access emergency money within 30 days, 55%. And almost half of respondents in a recent survey, including those from OECD countries, therefore rich countries, agreed with a statement I have no money left at the end of the month. In some places, we have seen both an increase in access to finance and simultaneously a decrease in financial health. So please, let us identify the best solutions to these challenges and really bring them to scale. One approach is to encourage private-private partnerships that provide services across entire value chains. In Côte d'Ivoire, for example, I saw an excellent partnership between an agri-tech platform, we agree, and a company that processes and distributes cashew nuts and a financial sector provider. Together, they were able to combine financial services, market access, business training, and extension services to help women across Côte d'Ivoire's cashew nut sector. This partnership has benefited everyone across the value chain, and it has increased efficiency, transparency, and productivity, supporting local economic development. Collaboration across industry and government is also key to creating inclusive digital public infrastructure that really enables services beyond finance. Think about health, think about education. These are the building blocks of sustainable development. If we get this right, digital innovation holds tremendous promise for financial inclusion and financial health. So let us please envision that better future, share our experiences, and use this conference, ladies and gentlemen, to build a secure, trusted, and efficient 
digital economy that really works for all. I really trust that you will actually take it to the next level and you can make a difference in your own countries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Majesty, for those very interesting insights. It has been a true privilege to have you on the Saiba stage. Farewell, and thank you again for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. It's a real pleasure to kick off this year's Saiba's conference. Geopolitical tides, an energy crisis, economic concerns, all of these add up to a very uncertain world right now. Our challenge is to understand and manage all of the risks and to make our way through. The financial system is the backbone that supports the wider economy. And so it has a vital role to play in these changing and indeed challenging times, during a time when the financial system itself is undergoing change. So today I want to talk about what that changing world of finance looks like and how the European Union is responding to the risks and opportunities of those changes, in particular in the areas of digital finance and payments. But I have to begin by addressing one horrific fact. War has returned to the European continent. Russia's brutal war is hitting Ukraine and its people first and foremost. In the European Union, we have relied on the financial system to help us implement sanctions on Russia. We imposed these sanctions alongside our international partners to show Russia that its illegal aggression will not go unanswered. Our sanctions have inflicted very real harm on the Russian economy and financial sector, with more effects which we will see over the medium term. There is a very clear cost for these banks, which means that the measure is working. Russia's war is also contributing to the rising cost of energy and food. In these difficult times, it's more important than ever to have a strong financial system as the backbone of the economy. The financial system itself is in a time of change and upheaval. Technology and innovation are having a huge impact. From the perspective of your average consumer, this might seem full of possibilities. You can now open a new account without ever needing to set a foot inside a physical bank branch. You can use all sorts of new apps to pay for things like splitting a bill among friends, online purchases or shopping at a market stall. You can even venture into the world of investing much more easily. For the financial sector, there is a lot going on right now and the pace of change and innovation is accelerating. New companies are sprouting up with new business models, new products and even completely new markets are emerging. Behind the scenes, internal processes are being revolutionized by artificial intelligence. But there are downsides as well. We risk leaving behind people who aren't as comfortable with technology, especially more vulnerable groups. Consumers can invest more easily, but without the right guidance and protection, they might take big risks and face big losses. The Financial Stability Board has warned that crypto markets could grow into a threat to global financial stability. In addition, the reliance of financial firms on the same providers for digital services could open them up to new risks. This new world of digital finance is exciting, fast moving and full of potential. But it's clear that there are risks as well. So our European regulatory agenda is about embracing the possibilities and at the same time guarding against the risks. We want the financial system to be resilient against all sorts of cyber risks. The Digital Operational Resilience Act means that all financial firms will have to be able to withstand risks like cyber attacks. And I welcome that EU institutions have concluded their negotiations and found a political agreement on this act. There is a clear and urgent need to bring crypto asset markets into the regulatory and supervisory fold. So I do welcome that there is agreement among the EU institutions on proceeding with our new and world leading regulation on markets in crypto assets. We also recognise the benefits in the technology behind crypto, distributed ledger technology. In March next year, a pilot regime will enter into force, allowing market participants and regulators in the European Union to experiment with trading and settlement of tokenised financial instruments 
using distributed ledger technology within safe boundaries. Our support for innovation in the European Union is strong and that also applies in the field of payments. In the coming weeks, the Commission plans to deliver a legislative proposal to speed up the rollout of instant payments in the European Union. Instant payments are a simple idea. Money changing hands at the click of a button and within seconds. But that simple idea has a powerful impact. For an individual who can pay their emergency repair person, for a small business that doesn't have to wait so long for invoices to be paid, and for financial firms that can offer new services based on this instant nature. But right now, only around 1 in 10 credit transfers made in euros are instant. At the current rate, it would take us 10 years to reach a full rollout of instant payments in the EU. So we simply can't afford to wait that long. Our legislative proposal will include measures to promote a much more widespread use of instant payments made in euro. Instant payments should be the norm and not a premium service. So they need to be priced proportionately, as is already the case in a number of EU countries. Consumers should feel confident about using instant payments, which means we should put in place safeguards to reduce the risk of fraud or indeed errors. And finally, providers should be able to rely on a consistent and efficient EU sanctioned screening process suitable for the instant nature of these payments. We believe that this instant payments proposal will bring us closer to a fully integrated market for payments in Europe. With the boom in private digital payments, central banks around the world are considering how to respond. And indeed, many are looking into central bank digital currencies. Today, over 100 countries are exploring this area. And that makes international cooperation absolutely essential. I welcome that the G7 has laid down a set of principles for central bank digital currencies. In the European Union, the Commission is working closely with the European Central Bank on a possible digital euro. A digital euro would be a companion to physical euro cash, which would keep its rightful and important role. And a digital euro would also provide an alternative, not a replacement, to private means of payment. The digital euro could provide new options for online payments, offline payments, peer-to-peer -peer payments and many more. We see a major role for private payment service providers in the distribution of the digital euro. Cooperation with the private sector would have clear economic benefits by increasing competition and innovation in the EU retail payment market. The Commission will propose a legislative proposal to lay down the principles for a digital euro in 2023. And this is a necessary step before the potential issuance of a digital euro by the European Central Bank. In these uncertain times, the role of regulators is to provide rules and guidelines to enable financial firms manage risk and take on only those risks which are manageable. In the EU, we're supporting financial innovation while guarding against the dangers. And we look forward to seeing the new innovations that will change finance for the better. So together, we are designing the future of finance. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Yawa Shah. Thank you again to Commissioner McGuinness and to Queen Maxima for kicking off our program for the week. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is once again my honor and privilege to be with you to provide you an update on your cooperative. And as is my tradition, I will focus on three things. One, execution of the SWIFT strategy. Two, SWIFT's continuous innovation and focus on the future. And three, leveraging the unique strength of our community. Let me take each one of those in turn. First, strategic execution. Banks are in a world of intense and intensifying competition. And it's coming from many directions. Fintechs, big tech, new technologies, and many more are challenging today's financial ecosystem. And of course, you know all this because you live it every day. 
But you also know firsthand that banks are equally leaning in hard on the future and significantly transforming the end client experience. We also see this at Swift. In fact, I'd like to point out a few inconvenient facts. When people ask me if banks are keeping pace with the changing times, allow me to talk a little bit about payments first. Most payments on Swift today use GPI, and that means 50% reach end beneficiaries within five minutes. What impacts speed? An analysis of Swift GPI data earlier this year with the BIS found that payments spend noticeably more time at the beneficiary leg than in the in-flight first leg. In fact, more than 80% of the processing time is at the beneficiary leg because of factors like capital controls and operating hours. And there's another important point. The research confirmed that cross-border payments on Swift involve typically one intermediary, again contradicting some misconceptions, and payments with three or more represent less than 1% of Swift's total volume. The point with all these stats is to underscore just how much our industry has transformed the payments experience and the strong foundations we have put in place. Swift's strategy is building on this and goes even further to enable instant and frictionless payments and securities transactions from account to account anywhere in the world. And we're not just providing you with just one or two components either, but delivering a whole package that provides a seamless end-to-end -end experience for you and your end customers. This capability is unique to Swift, and we have been laser-focused on the execution. Today, you can check on the security of your course counterparties to make sure you are doing business with them. You can pre-check beneficiary account details to confirm upfront that a payment will get to its ultimate destination. Automatically spot potential anomalies you want to watch out for in flight. Handle problems that come up in real time. And maintain the visibility of your transaction all the way for you and your customers. And that is just not on the high value whole side either. Since we spoke this time last year, we are building great momentum on Swift Go that allows banks to get much more innovation and com competition in this space with their front end offerings to small businesses and consumers for low value payments, reusing Swift in the back end. In the next few months, we'll make a huge advance in cross-border landscape as we activate Swift's transaction management capabilities. This is a step change in the way international transactions work, taking us beyond sequential messaging to an API-driven orchestration layer, which will power future services such as anomaly detection, data analytics, tracking, and exception management. And all of this powered by ISO 20022 rich data. The payments industry demanded this new standard to drive increased automation and innovation and better, better customer experiences and reduce processing exceptions. Now, you all have put in significant effort to get ready for this with multi-year preparations in full swing. There are three levels to this. Swift readiness, community readiness, and MI readiness. Swift is prepared and looking at how we support you and the whole ecosystem. As, and as we near the start of the migration window in November, we are looking at all kinds of what ifs, as you would expect, to support execution, which must be impeccable, given the systemic implications of this transition. And we have also one more topic in the business side, securities. We see huge potential in securities as well. As you may know, securities is about 50% of our traffic, and it's an important part of our future. 
We're working closely with the industry players to tackle common pain points that create friction, and that leads to settlement fails. This includes work like the new SWIFT Securities View that we recently announced, which will bring new levels of transparency in the post-trade processing world. Underpinning all this is our continued work in areas like financial crime compliance and cybersecurity through the customer security program to help the industry achieve ever higher levels of efficiency and effectiveness. But as you know, I always like to cover three points. So let me just also emphasize that even as we execute faster than we ever have, we never lose focus on what matters the most, the security, the reliability, and the resiliency of our network. This is absolutely fundamental to our franchise and where we make significant investments every year. And we have plans to do even more. Watch this space. And as you know, we are overseen by the G10 central banks, which underscores our unique role in the world. And this further reinforces our strong commitment to innovating responsibly. Which brings me to my second point, our relentless focus on the future. Unfortunately, none of us has a crystal ball, but it's still vital that we prepare for the future. So we have to think in several different dimensions all at once. There are things we can predict with high levels of confidence. There are things that we think are maybe likely. Then there, are, of course, there are things that take us by complete surprise, like pandemics that we're, while we can't say what nature they will take or if and when they will come, we still have to anticipate. SWIFT is constantly doing this, anticipating the things that could impact our community. In fact, as a global neutral cooperative owned by you, we are uniquely placed to build the foundations for the next generation for the financial services industry. Now, I've already shared how our strategy is gearing up and setting up the industry for, sex, sex, for success <laughs> for decades to come. And the instant and frictionless future we know that we are preparing for. SWIFT also plays a vital role in identifying and evaluating emerging technologies and their business implications. We have a chief financial officer and an entire innovation team solely focused on this. And their work is even more important than ever before at this pivotal stage in the financial services digital transformation. We're, we are innovating in multiple areas to anticipate how we can help you adapt and adopt different forms of value with a focus on interoperability. SWIFT is working across the industry with banks, central banks, market infrastructures, and regulators on numerous proofs of concept, and is closely examining emerging trends in areas such as central bank digital currencies, tokenized assets, where we just announced some breakthrough work, and the linking of market infrastructures to explore how it can support interoperability and enable the seamless flow of value. Of course, none of us alone can figure out the future. And with the forces of disruption that are out there, competitors, technological change, geopolitical shifts, economic turbulence, and so much more, there's a lot to keep us all awake at night. These are challenging, complex times, uncertain times. None of us knows what's beyond the horizon. But working together will put us in the best possible position when we get there. And this brings me to my final point, the strength of the SWIFT community. Amongst us, we have the talent, we have the technology, we have the financial resources. And through SWIFT, the cooperative that is focused on delivering for each and every one of you, we have the mechanisms and the will to solve for the future together. Our North Star is and always will be 
to focus on what our community needs from us, remaining true to our core mission, which is to be a neutral provider, powering bank-centric future at a scale and with a strong and unwavering focus on, same thing, security, reliability, resiliency. As you've heard me say so many times before, you get out of SWIFT what you put into it. And that it's important that you engage with us and the financial community, leveraging the services that will secure the foundations of our industry for the years to come, and con continue to challenge us with the opportunities you want to seize, so that together we can realize a faster, better, smarter, responsible future. So, in conclusion, allow me to reemphasize my three themes. Execution of the SWIFT strategy, continuous innovation, and focus on the future, and the unique strength of our community. And in closing, my thanks go to the board and their tremendous engagement and governance during a challenging year, the NMGs, national member groups, for representing the communities worldwide. You are the heart and soul of SWIFT. And the entire SWIFT management team and SWIFT employees worldwide for their ongoing commitment, hard work, hard work and devotion. They really care for you all. It is my personal honor and privilege to serve on your behalf as the chairman of the board of SWIFT. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now please welcome to the stage Javier. Okay, so thank you, Yawar, and to all of you, hello again. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. <laughs> well, it's great to be here and indeed to welcome you to the first Cybos since the pandemic. And I'm entering now my fourth year as CEO, and every March I had the same question to answer. Will we or will we not be in person at Cybos? Well, this year, uh, the decision was a little easier, but bringing in more than 8,000 people, we are, of course, uh, have taken nothing for granted, and uh, we've considered dozens of factors to deliver a, you know, the best possible cybos in a safe and sustainable way. And I hope you agree, right? It's great to be back. And, uh, you know, it's also quite fitting to be here in Amsterdam, uh, you know, for our return to a physical cybos. Because, uh, you know, the, the Netherlands is uh, a great example of a community that truly knows what it means to collaborate, to innovate, and to adapt its, phys its physical infrastructure. And, um, well, I don't know if you know, but uh, about one-third of the country is below sea level. Uh, so it has survived, actually, through an amazing network of drainage systems that prevent, prevent flooding. It has the Netherlands actually one of the most sophisticated anti flooding systems in the world. And uh, if that critical infrastructure wasn't in place and working so effectively, well, Cybos could be underwater right now. <laughs> and talking about collaboration, innovation, and adaptation, I think our SWIFT community knows something about it as well. Well, you know, we need that spirit to be able to address the global challenges that we'll be discussing this week. I mean, challenges like climate change, geopolitics, pandemics, you know, raising energy costs, uh, inflation, recessions that are affecting people all over the world. So, and of course, we just heard it, uh, financial inclusion uh, from Queen Maxima, still a lot of work to be done, and we have a very important role to play as an industry. And there is no doubt that some of these global shifts 
are already having an impact in the, in the industry. And take the pandemic. Uh, well, the worst pandemic in 100 years has massively accelerated digitalization as institutions raced to meet uh, the growing needs from businesses and consumers all over the world. And having navigated the pandemic, the current geopolitical crisis was fast on its heels, with, of course, the war in Ukraine that has, has tragic uh, human consequences, as well as broader geopolitical ramifications. Well, we heard it from Commissioner McGuinness. She talked about the industry's role in sanctions. Obviously, uh, SWIFT was brought into the spotlight like never before due to our role in the financial ecosystem. As you all know by now, we are uh, subject to EU law and we implement, implement its EU sanctions decisions and work together with banks to comply with our collective responsibility to implement them. And alongside those really extraordinary uh, uh, external factors like the pandemic and uh, uh, geopolitics, the uh, technology has kept on accelerated at a massive pace. And our industry press today is full of the future promise of uh, CBDCs, uh, tokenization, or artificial intelligence, to name a few. And that's just today's news. If uh, you head over to InnoTribe, I'm sure you will, uh, during the week, you'll hear the latest about DeFi, Web 3.0, and the metaverse. So it's a great uh, promising concepts that are out there. But we still have our fair share of uh, challenges. You know, uh, in different ways, each of these external factors, uh, the pandemic, geopolitics, and new technologies, are all contributing to, an in to the increasing fragmentation of the global financial industry. And uh, this is something, by the way, is a theme that has come up repeatedly in recent meetings with uh, CEOs of financial institutions and also government leaders uh, all over the world. The IMF, in fact, uh, predicts that just technological fragmentation alone uh, can uh, send some countries into reverse gear and cut their GDPs by uh, 5%. And uh, let's not forget as well that for transactions uh, across borders, interconnection is everything. And our community, as the backbone to the financial industry, has always been uh, a symbol of global cooperation, uh, you know, focusing on the opportunities that can bring us together. And that's why I believe that we're perfectly placed to uh, you know, uh, be part of the solution in addressing this global fragmentation. Let me lay out why. Well, first is that we are about more than messaging. You know, we bring standards, data, security, and compliance to keep the world connected with the right levels of transparency, risk, and control. In fact, every year, we raise the bar even higher on resilience, cyber, and endpoint security through our customer security program. And when we innovate, we innovate responsibly, because maintaining trust in the industry is more important than ever. So a strong and secure core is the foundation. But with our vision to connect up to 4 billion accounts worldwide in an instant, we are making international transactions work faster, smarter, and better. Thinking of our role, uh, let me take the example of our rock concert. We take care of all the back-end technology and hundreds of other details behind the scenes so that you can focus on the one thing that matters the most, wowing the audience with a flawless and memorable experience. So I can tell you, we are certainly delivering on all that uh, promise. You know, I will not go back to uh, uh, what Yawa, the specifics that Yawa just went through, but if we take the benchmarks that the G20 has set for improving cost, speed, transparency, and choice and access, we are showing strong momentum against those. Let me go quickly through them. I mean, on the speed, you know, uh, there is uh, the, G, uh, the FSB has said that by, 2020, by 2027, 75% uh, of all international transactions should reach end beneficiaries within an hour. 
Well, you heard it from Yawar. We are well underway with you know, about 50% of all GPI payments reaching end beneficiary accounts within five minutes. On cost, we are stripping out friction-related costs from the industry through data and screening services, and as well, of course, through pre-validation. You know, that has uh, not only the potential to improve the cross-border payment experience, but it also uh, can remove potentially millions, if not billions, of costs from the industry. And that is through our own services, but also through partnerships, potentially. So lots uh, going on on the cost front, as well on the transparency front. Uh, you know, with GPI, we provided end-to-end -end payment chain transparency at completely new levels. And by the way, yes, uh, we mentioned it as well, we're taking that same level of transparency now to the securities post trade space with securities view that will allow you to track securities transactions end-to-end -end and prevent the costly challenge of settlement fails. So uh, with uh, all of that, of course, choice and access is a key point as well. We are providing, opening up new uh, accesses to the SWIFT platform uh, through our uh, cloud and API-based uh, connectivity solutions. And that is not just for traditional SWIFT services, uh, SWIFT messaging, uh, but also for full transaction services uh, powered by our new transaction manager. So, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that, uh, that uh, all of that is in place, GPI has allowed us to uh, take that to the next level uh, in terms of the wholesale space. But right now, we can also apply the same to the retail space with SwiftGo. Uh, you will be hearing about it. What that means is that we're improving the speed and transparency for all retail payments so that you uh, can offer new services to your end customers. But remember the Rock Concert is not just about what's visible up front, it's also about reliable and compliant technology in the back. That is, let's face it, becoming increasingly a differentiator in these retail segments. So that's where we stand today, uh, but uh, we are also taking innovation to the next level. And you know, let's take uh, CBDCs and uh, digital money. We heard it as well from uh, Commissioner McGuinness. Uh, there are um, over 100 countries now exploring CBDCs, but in that front, international cooperation is essential. So, well, well, very pleased. I mean, you may have heard, uh, seen it already that uh, last week we announced the results of uh, groundbreaking experiments in that field uh, with, uh, that show essentially that CBDC DLT networks can be interlinked and not just with each other all over the world, but also with existing payment systems. And what this means is that as CBDCs will be rolled out, they can you know, automatically, immediately scale and be used globally. And all of that, uh, we're achieving it through SWIFT's new transaction manager that is acting as a bridge. And exciting to see as well that an increasing number of major central banks and commercial banks are joining this sandbox. And we have similar experiments as well going on in the security space uh, with uh, you know, leading edge uh, innovation on tokenization. Um, as digital assets mature, they can also be seamlessly exchanged across borders. And of course, with November almost upon us, uh, re you know, rich data uh, through ISO 2022 is also a big part of the industry's innovation agenda. We're fully ready at SWIFT to support the start of the coexistence for cross-border payments. And what is really exciting is to, to see that, uh, you know, over time, there is a huge potential for, uh, you know, uh, improving the frictionless uh, future for cross-border payments and further innovation, leveraging that rich data. So you can see uh, this is a join-up uh, vision uh, that addresses uh, fragmentation and that where the whole becomes now bigger than the sum of its parts. But we can't do this alone. And we need you if we want to transform and the, the speed, transparency, 
and interconnectedness of uh, the global ecosystem, we need you to adopt these new innovations and you know, doing that across the global ecosystem. And I can tell you, we are here to support you every step of the way. I've been part of SWIFT for over two decades now, nearing three. <laughs> well, in case you were wondering, I started when I was five. <laughs> uh, and I just love SWIFT's capacity for change. You know, last time I stood in front of you, uh, in my first year as uh, CEO, you know, it would have been impossible to predict that a global pandemic and a geopolitical crisis were just ahead. Uh, there will be certainly future unknown challenges, I'm sure, but uh, I am convinced that our unique global organization will be more relevant than ever before. And that because we have a purpose in unifying the financial industry, and uh, that, uh, I have no doubt, will be uh, more critical and definitely needed for the next decades to come. Let's appreciate also the chance this week for in-person human connection and you know, take the bigger picture. Is that we know technology is great, but as the saying goes, technology is at its best when it brings people together. So I would like to thank the entire SWIFT team for having worked so hard over the past two years to see us through the challenges that we have. But also, I would like to thank you all for being such a united global community. I really look forward to engaging with as many of you as possible during the course of the week. Thank you, and have a great Cybos. Sometimes, things just matter. Like when help needs to get there quickly, when problems need urgent solutions. When small things are a big deal. When your big dream is just one step from reality or new ways to grow are on the other side of the world, we know that behind every transaction is a purpose that matters. And it's why, together, we are making global finance move fast. With certainty wherever, whenever, and however it needs to go. For families, for economies, for all of us, for better.